Hey everyone, I am here with our wonderful Senior Minister Simon Manchester and today we are thinking about the issue of what do we say in conversation when the uh, topic of religious liberty comes up. So you could imagine a few months from now, or maybe a few weeks from now, Israel Folau, that case kind of gets blown up again in the media and your friends are talking about it at work. How do you respond? How do you say something helpful? And at the same time, how do, how do you lead it to the gospel? Um, but before I get into that, I thought I'd ask you, Simon, just for maybe thoughts off the top of your head about religious liberty and how to, how to talk about religious liberty well as a Christian. Well, I think one of the things that people are aware of in this country is that um, there is freedom of speech. Um, people are not quite sure what to do with hate speech and prejudice speech, but as long as we're talking free speech, um, which is gracious uh, and kind, we probably have got fantastic freedoms to talk and uh, we ought to be able to say to people, you're expressing your point of view and I'm listening very carefully and I'm going to express my point and I'd like you to listen carefully and we'll try and weigh these things up together. Yeah, and it's such a blessing as well that we live in a country where we can. Hmm. Uh, and we have the freedom here in Australia to to share the gospel with people. Yeah, yeah know, that's right. I think um, Carson talked about old tolerance and new tolerance and he said, you know, old tolerance is where uh, I listen to you, you listen to me. We don't necessarily have to agree, but the friendship stays. Yeah. But he said new tolerance means that uh, if you don't say what I think, then the friendship's over. Yeah. And uh, that's just a, that's a tragedy. That's a mistake. Yeah, it's, not to, it's nice to be able to have friendships with people you disagree with. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Where would the rugby league world be, you know, without different priorities and teams and all that sort of thing? Yeah. You know, it's part of the fun. Yeah. I want to ask you about how you can get a conversation about religious liberty to the gospel. Uh, but religious liberty can be a controversial topic. Uh, and I was wondering, how do you deal, just again, general, we'll get into specifics soon, how do you deal with a controversial topic when you're talking with a neighbor or a friend? Um, how, how do you step around things or how do you approach things carefully and wisely? Um, well, three things. One, I get all my best thoughts about a week later. So, you know, I'm not that quick. Um, you are quick, Jared. So no, you could uh, you. you could do this much yeah. better than I could. But uh, why don't you give me, thirdly, an example, you know, raise a topic and see yeah. how, the, how the thinking might go. Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't we start with that Israel Flower case? So okay. imagine... Um, a we month work together? Yep. You yep. work together. It's, um, I think it's November, somewhere around there, where his court case is coming up. Yep. And so suddenly it's back on the front pages of the newspaper mm. and people will say to you something like, you know, what do you make of this whole Israel Folau case? Yeah. Where do you go from there? How do you respond as a Christian? Yeah, I, I think I would ask a question perhaps and say, you know, do you think he's put his fingers, has he hit a nerve? You know, and what, what, what is the nerve? You know, is it that um, it's just outrageous that he would have some kind of prejudice against certain elements of society? Or is it that he's raised the question of hell in a high and pompous way? Um, what, what, what nerve has he hit? That's what I'd like to know. And then you might find out a little more of what the person's thinking. So imagine you say to me, what do you make of this guy, you know, Israel Folau? He's a nuisance. And I say to you, look, he seems to have hit a nerve. What nerve has he hit? And I might say something like, well, it seems to be a nerve with uh, gay people mm -hmm. who are really offended by what he said in, in his tweet. And that seems to be the nerve that he's hit. And then I might say something like, was he just talking about gay people or a whole lot of people? Yeah. And the obvious answer is a whole lot of people. And then second question is, how come we did pick on one group of the group that he mentioned? Mm. Why did this come up? Um, why didn't the greedy people get angry and why didn't the adulterous people get angry you know why did we get angry about one group I've heard, I've heard someone respond to this and they said the reason they get angry about this particular group is actually a, a, uh, a man who identifies as gay he's a commentator of rugby union and he said the reason is that they get upset about this one group is because this is a group he says that is born that way they don't make a decision he himself um, kind of 
discovered um, that he was attracted to the same sex as he was mm. growing up in England and this is the one in the group that is kind of ingrained is how, is how he put it. Yeah. yeah. And that raises huge questions again because there are some people within the gay community who don't like the idea of being told that I was born this way. They want to say, no, this is my decision. And so I think I would want to say to people, uh, do you think that people are angry at being told that they should do something that they can't help? Or are they being angry? Are they getting angry because they're being told that they're robots programmed in one direction? You know, where, where is this coming from? Mm. I'd, like, I'd be interested to know a bit more about that. Mm. Yeah. And then there's also the fact that the, like recently there's been scientific journals coming out saying they haven't been able to discover the gay gene after so many years of trying to find it there seems to be a combination of hereditary and yeah. environment and yeah yeah that's yeah. all the jury's out on all of that yeah. and the other thing is to say um you know do, do we mean that if a person can't help themselves we should be backing them Mm. And let's put aside the emotion of the uh, gay debate. Mm. Let's ask a question like stealing. If a person says, I just can't stop myself, you know, I think I was born like this. Should we at that point back off and say all is well? Yes. Yeah. Or drunkenness. Yeah. Like is mentioned in, I think, well, it's in 1 Corinthians 6. I'm not sure if it's in his Raphael's um, post. I think it is in his yeah. list, yeah. Which has a much higher kind of genetic component to it yeah. than... Yeah. Sexuality. Yeah. yeah. And we know that when it gets onto the subject of I couldn't help myself, there's a lot of people in every community who will say, well, that's just not good enough. Yeah. Because we can all think of examples where somebody will do something and say, I'm sorry, it wasn't my fault. I mm. couldn't help myself. Yeah. Somebody else made me do it. And we'll say, no, you've got to take responsibility. So the next step then is, so we talk about these different issues and it's interesting you go down the rabbit hole in one particular direction, don't you? Yeah. How do we kind of pull out of there in a way or dig through the other side of it to get to the gospel? How would you go from this kind of conversation to pointing people to Jesus? Well, I think if we go back to the Israel Folau thing, I'd be asking the question, do you think he said it out of hate or love? Um, because my suspicion is, however much we disagree with what he said, or even how much we disagree with some of his views, his theological views. The question is, did he say it because he was concerned for people to um, make a turning, a U-turn perhaps, um, to find uh, forgiveness in Jesus, which everybody needs? And therefore, was he actually posting something out of kindness? That's mm. my question. Yeah. And if that's the case, does he represent uh, a master, a lord, a king, a saviour called Jesus, who did the same, mm. who warned people or called people, um, even with grief and sadness and tears, to turn back and be safe. Mm. And then encourage the other person to investigate Jesus. Or... Yeah, I think I'd say, you know, however badly um, Israel Folau did it, and I'm perfectly capable of doing it badly myself, you know, I could walk around with a big turn or burn sign and a big frown on my face and yell at people and scowl and just do the whole thing horrendously. That's but plan the, for next year, isn't it? Not exactly. <laughs> but um, the question is, does he represent somebody who said the same thing well, mm. kindly, lovingly, meaningfully, significantly, yeah. urgently, and um, truthfully, that there is a need to get off a broad road and get into a narrow road? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's in really which helpful. case, in which case, he represents somebody who loved people to death, mm. and that's the great thing about Jesus, isn't it? That he loved people to death. And if you look at Jesus, he's he is gentle with people who need gentleness, mm. and he is confronting to people who need confronting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's probably other ways to work from this issue to the gospel, mm. but uh, that, I mean that's just one thing. I've thought, I've thought of one actually is to just say you look at that group of people that Israel Folau identifies in the tweet hmm. or whatever it was, Instagram post. And you say, I'm in there. <laughs> I'm one of those people who deserves hell. Yeah. And I need Jesus. Yeah. Just as much as yeah. you, you do. Yeah. And you could... That's a good point. Yeah, it's a yeah. good point. Because uh, g coming up with a list of sins, you know, with a small s, is just one way of identifying the sin with a capital S, mm -hmm. disease. Um, 
And as Jesus said, you know, he's the doctor, he's coming to the world to save people from this disease. How do we make people aware of the disease? Well, it's not by patting them on the head and saying, do whatever you like, all's well. At some stage, we've got to say, I have the disease. This is what it looks like. You may have that. You do have the disease. This is what it may look like. Mm. Israel Folau has tried to identify the disease behind the sins with a good cause. Mm. Um, one other idea I've had is you could say to people who find it offensive, you could say, well, there's kind of two, two kinds of people in the world. There's people who care about what the Bible says about homosexuality. And there's people who don't care about what the Bible says about homosexuality. That first group of people who care will find Israel Folau's tweet informative. Yeah. The second group of people who don't care what the Bible says, they'll just go, well, I don't care about what Israel Folau copies and pastes from the Bible. And so they can dismiss it. No one needs to be hurt or yeah. feel badly about it in either of those two cases. That's quite a dispassionate road to go down, isn't it? Yeah, you could imagine some people saying to you, why is he talking about it at all? Why doesn't he just leave us alone? Yeah. So, but if you're dealing with somebody who's sort of cool-headed and rational and wants a, a sophisticated debate that you're capable of, Jared, and sure. I'm not, this could be a great way to go. Yeah. Um, just another question. In your general in, like, conversations with neighbours, people that you meet, you're very gifted at getting things to the gospel quite, quite quickly in your conversations. What kind of things do you do to to do that well i'm conscious that my neighbors have had very little from me um, and i feel quite uneasy about it and i think the closer the person lives to you the more awkward it is yeah and you really feel as though i don't want to live next to somebody in an awkward way um, so i'm not that good i'm quite good with people who i'll never see again i'm perfectly happy to throw bombs out the car window <laughs> yeah. at those sort of people um not literally not literally <laughs> and, and i don't know what i would say to people i think um I, I am how do you do that by the way with strangers or people you're not going to see very often you know you, you do it in cafes you you how, how do you do it just to help train the rest of us what well, do you do what's your I suppose if I was, um, well, who was I having a meal with the other day? I was having a meal with somebody in town and um, the waiter came over at the end and he said, um, how was everything? And I said, it was great. And you know why this guy brought me here? Because I'm his pastor. And um, as a thank you, he wanted me to experience your food. And so that's how much he thinks of his pastor. Um, that you know he would take him out for lunch yeah. which was a really lovely thing to do and then I said to him something like um, do you know what a pastor does mm. and uh, he looked a little bit uh, stunned and so the next thing is to say something like I try to tell people how to be ready to meet Jesus mm. safely yeah. and then again he looks a bit stunned and if he starts clearing away and moving away you know it's time to drop the subject but uh, uh, eventually, toward the end of the meal, I said to him, look, uh, in my wallet here, I've got one of the tiny little books that I write, so I'll give you one. So I gave him a little book and left him. So what did he know at the end of the conversation? He knew that I was a minister. He'd heard about Jesus. He'd been given a little booklet. That was the yeah. best I could do. That's great. What about for those of us who aren't pastors, who haven't written little books? How would you <laughs> um, then go to... Yeah, bring up the gospel, share Christ in everyday conversation. Again, say with a, a waiter at a at a table like that. Yeah, well, if you're with another guy from your church, you could say, uh, guess where we uh, both are on the weekends? Yeah. We're both at the same church. We know each other from the same church. Yeah. And then you could say something to amuse him, the waiter. You could say something like, you didn't think anybody normal went to church anymore, but look at us, we're both really normal. Yeah. yeah. And then you could say, in fact, I'm going to leave you a memento from our church written by our crazy pastor, and out <laughs> comes your little booklet. Yeah. So uh, I'm just thinking, take advantage of the situations. Yeah. And this guy who I had lunch with, he said to me, God bless him, he said to me, how can I be more effective as a Christian? Mm. And this is before the conversation. And I said to him, well, I think, you know, think John 15, abide in Jesus, walk with him, 
love his people and try and be a witness. And he said, yeah, but how do you do these things? And I said, well, you know, you could easily say, I like this restaurant so much I've brought my pasta. Yeah. In which case this guy suddenly knows you're a believer. Mm. So you've opened the door for the next yeah. conversation. And those are often, um, it's just a, an, an awkward feeling that we have it within us to jump over that hurdle, isn't it? Yeah. And we've just got to bite that bullet and go, I'm going to feel awkward here for a few seconds. And but I, you get more natural at it, I suppose, the more you do it. I think the combination of saying something that's reasonably normal. Yeah. You know, it's not the suddenly, do you know Jesus? Yeah. Which is just horrendous. Yeah. And... Um, weird um, it's knowing that what you're about to say is not going to embarrass you and shouldn't embarrass them yeah it's um, Jeff the waiter you wouldn't believe this but Bill and, my, and myself over here we actually go to the same church that's why we're catching mm, up mm, yeah and um, you've actually played down the embarrassment you've said uh, believe it or not you know we may look strange mm. but we go to the same church yeah. not only do we go to the same church but we're very thankful for the same Jesus. Mm. That may be a little more stressful to say yeah, that, but yeah. I think the more you say it though, the more you get practice at it, the less awkward you feel about it. Yeah. And one of the things that keeps me going is not just, you know, oh, I'm a professional, I've got to do this, but how many times am I going to get to say something to this person? Yeah. You know, who's going to come across their path? Who's praying for this person that someone will come across their path? and say something, why shouldn't yeah. it be me? That's so great. That's so great. Okay, so let's go back on to religious liberty. So we're thinking about how to get to the gospel as well, but religious liberty. Another question someone might ask you um, over lunch, say, at, at work, um, or just a friend picking up kids from school, whatever it is. Maybe it is at the school gate and someone says, I don't think schools should be able to discriminate against gay teachers. How would you respond to that? Are you talking about a Christian school? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think my first reaction would be to try and normalize the issue so that the person understood it. So I would say something like, if you were organizing a team of football players, would you want them all to be committed to the same game? Um, or if you were trying to organize uh, a political party, would you want them to be all on side with you? Mm -hmm. um, in other words, it's possible to turn it back and see that it would be very difficult for them to run something where there is a division mm. in the minds of the people. Yeah. Um, let's take something simple. We're trying to organize a park for the local suburb. Mm. Will we build up a team where 11 are for the park and one is against the park? Mm. Would it not be better for us to get a team of 12 who are for the park? Yeah. So I think it's entirely reasonable if the school is aiming to educate, but also to tell people about Jesus, that the people who are involved in the education should be willing to educate and tell people about Jesus. Yes. Yeah. I mean, how could that be unreasonable? And I would perhaps take it further and say how awkward it will be for the team to have somebody who's counterproductive and how difficult it would be for the individual yeah. if they're part of a system which is opposed to everything they think. But then there's schools that do have people who aren't Christians in them, like Christian schools who have teachers who aren't yeah. Christians. How would you differentiate between that and someone who say, has gone and entered into a uh, same-sex marriage? Well, I mean, take a private school down the road where mm. they've got um, a Christian framework and a Christian headmaster and a Christian chaplain or two or three. Um, they would be saying to staff, this is an Anglican school, we're going to have chapel, we're going to have scripture. The aim of the school is to educate, but it's also to introduce boys to the Christian faith. Uh, do you have any problems with that? Mm. If the teacher says, yes, I have violent objections, I think it would be better to, to say to them, you're going to have a terrible time here. Mm. You know, don't apply for the job. Um, so that's very different. 
having a non-Christian teacher who's part of a Christian school, who's not being asked to teach scripture, not being asked to preach in chapel, but is being asked to support the ethos of the school mm. from somebody who comes in and says, I'm completely opposed to the ethos mm. of the school. Yeah. But then there could be someone who comes in and claims to be for the ethos of the school, but has entered into a same-sex marriage or relationship. Does that kind of change the situation? Well, I think it depends on whether they are willing to support everything that's going on or whether they're going to start undermining everything that goes on. Yeah. Um, to say nothing of how difficult it is for the job of the, say, the chaplain to get up and say, the person who follows Jesus needs to turn away from everything that Jesus says to turn away from. Mm. So we might say to the teacher who's joined the school and said, I'm for it, but I'm now changed my mind on this. And I think that um, the gay lifestyle is perfectly fine. Mm. We may need to say to that teacher, uh, this school, as you know, is trying to take Jesus seriously. We're trying to take his direction seriously, his teaching seriously. And therefore, what will you do when you come to chapel and the chaplain is passing on the, the truth of Christ? Mm. Yeah. Um, and it's also about the, you want teachers who um, aren't undermining what the school's trying to teach through their lives either. Yeah, that's true. Like, yeah, um, yeah that's you know, true. You wouldn't want a teacher who came to school and said, yep, I'm, I'm all for uh, Christianity. Well, well, at least I'll let you do your Christian thing and I'll support that. I won't get involved in it. And then outside of school was... Um, seeking to undermine Christi Christianity actively, you know, maybe exactly. a really rabid exactly. atheist trying to... Exactly. And I mean, if the teacher says in the classroom, uh, you know, I happen to be a, a gay man, and the pupils of the school who think this is a Christian school say, how do you reconcile that with your Christian faith? And he says, oh, it's easy. I would have thought it was very difficult. Hmm. A, a practicing gay lifestyle and the Christian faith, they don't mix together. Yeah. But if he says... Um, uh, if he's asked in the classroom, um, how do you reconcile your place in the school with the ethos of the school? And he says, um, well, I'm perfectly happy with both. There's a confusion for the pupils. If he says I'm against the ethos of the school, and in fact, I would encourage you in the classroom to not believe what's being taught in the chapel. Mm. Well, you really do have, to put it strongly, an enemy in the ranks. Mm. And you've got to, at that point, say, look, don't undermine us and don't fight us. It would be much better for you and the school if we went separate ways. Yeah. Now, I know that's very controversial, but mm. the two roads are both painful, aren't they? To yeah. stay is painful, to go is painful. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay, so you're having this conversation with um, I don't know, a parent at pickup, in my case, um, and you, you go through this idea of, well, you want people to be on the same team, same football team, same political party, same mind as they go about it. Mm -hmm. and, and you explain this. Is there a way then to get that conversation to Christ? How would you go from there to getting it to Christ? Gee, at the school gates, yeah, you'd have to be, uh, you'd have to be very clever to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking off the cuff. Yeah. I think I'd be going one step at a time. Yeah. I mean, uh, just imagine you said to me, I don't really like this school because of their policy on... Um, you know, the spectrum of teachers not being permitted in the school. Mm. And I would say something like, in the end, um, we really do need a united team. Mm. In fact, Jesus once said that if a house is divided, it'll soon fall apart. Mm. Mm. Um, and the wonderful thing about Jesus Christ is that he brings people to love God with their mind, their heart, their soul and their strength. Mm. And the way he does that is by giving them a brand new life. And the way he gives them a brand new life is by dying for them. Yeah. And this is what um, the love of Christ looks like, that he would die to give a life yeah. which would bring people back to him and back together. Mm. By this time, the person at the gate has walked off <laughs> quite quickly. Yeah, it could be something where you... Yeah, it's hard to have the conversation so quickly, isn't it? Exactly. It's something maybe a, asking them, would you be interested to catch up for a coffee and talk about this further? And yeah. Yeah, maybe in I can fact, explain the big picture of Christianity and why we have what are perceived as these strange views about yes. about sex. And yeah, and you're absolutely right. It's often the one-to-one -one conversation mm -hmm. done peaceably, which 
builds all the understanding. Mm. So I had a guy who um, contacted me because I got a couple of letters in the paper and uh, he was a vet in the eastern suburbs and he said, I'd like to come and talk to you. I just have so many disagreements with your position. And we sat at the table and he asked all these questions and I tried to answer him. And at the end of it, he just said, you know, this has been so helpful. Wow. Um, so it was a good day. It could mm. have been a terrible day. Mm. But um, the, the one-to-one, I don't think it's the um, preaching at the gate, school gate, which is going to solve all those problems. I think um, speaking at the school gate is probably just to say one peaceful thing. Yeah. And then often we fumble through it as well when we do. And yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You, you, you say one thing one time and you think, oh, yeah. I should have said something different, but you have something better to say for next time. Well, I've often told the story in that um, book of Glenn Harrison's, which is called A Better Story, where he talks about the people meeting at the school gates with the two strollers, you know, little boy, little girl in the strollers. You remember this? No. And uh, one couple, oh, one mother says, um, uh, isn't it interesting? You know, we've got this little boy, little girl. One day they may grow up to marry each other. And the other mother says, or your little boy may marry a little boy, and my little girl may marry a little girl. What do you say at that moment? Yeah. And you think, what, almost whatever you say is going to get you into big trouble yeah. at that point. Yeah. If you say, oh, I hope not, or that'll never happen, it just t- sounds terrible, bigoted and awful. So I've asked a whole lot of people, what would you say? And my sister-in-law, who's very quick on her feet, she said, I would say I have much, much higher hopes for my children than they will just, just that they will get married. Hmm. Yeah. That's an intriguing answer. Mm. Yeah. That's good. And it's uh, politically respectable because, you know, the idea that you've got to get married to be a person yeah. is, um, is a nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, I've got another one here, another kind of question that might come up. How do we answer it well and also lead it to the gospel? Do you think anybody is awake anymore? <laughs> Maybe. Um, so what if, what if then, following on from that conversation, someone says, well, isn't it a bit hypocritical? Like, um, Christians want to be able to deny employment to a gay teacher, and then at the same time they complain when Israel Folau gets fired, denied employment, for speaking against homosexuality in his Instagram post. Isn't that a bit hypocritical of Christians to kind of want to protect the school on one hand and want to complain against Australian Rugby Union on the other hand? Well, I think the teacher who's perhaps being put off is, as I say, being put off from a team committed to the Christian faith. And that's reasonable. If Israel Folau attacked the code of rugby and said it was unconstitutional, it was immoral, it was dangerous, it was destructive, then he should be asked to leave the the team, the rugby team, because he's attacking the very team that he's playing in. So I think the two are quite different. On the one hand, you've got a teacher being put off because they actually disagree with their charter. But what Israel Folau is doing is he's not disagreeing with the rules of his rugby charter. He's speaking to the whole world and saying within the whole world there is a safe way to go and a dangerous way to go and I'm for the safe way. Mm. Yeah. So, so it's about what's, what's the actual organisation about, what's its charter Yeah. for the school teaching yeah. the Christian faith, for rugby union scoring tries. And he's in, pretty good at scoring tries. In the end, if you... T- yeah, he is very good at scoring tries. In the end, if you take a biblical view, what the school is doing is they're guarding the gospel. And what Israel Folau is doing is he's guarding the gospel. So one is being put off from the school in order to guard the gospel. Um, in some ways, it's the greater good is being looked after. What Israel Folau is doing is he's also guarding the gospel and shouldn't be punished for that. Mm. But obviously there will be hostility and opposition for faithfulness. So, you know, you've got to expect these Mm. things. You can't appeal to the world to be nice to you. Mm. You could be as reasonable as possible. And I think I have to say that um, the post that Israel Folau put up is probably not the best way to have communicated the issues. Mm. There were better ways to do it. But uh, boy, oh boy, he hit a nerve. You Mm. know, he really hit a nerve. Yeah. 
Yep. And we all fumble around trying to witness to Christ. Yeah. And um, yeah. I'm sure I've said worse things. You know, he's... Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. Um, why do you think that this issue of religious liberty... Or, or what do you think about the fact that this issue of religious liberty does seem to so often come into contact, conflict with what you could call sexual liberty or sexual freedoms? It's like a fight that we don't want to have in a way. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is the biblical danger. Um, Let's call it porneia, the whole range of sexual disobedience. This is the area that is being championed by the world. So as Kel Richards has said, uh, the gay lobby is not just asking us to tolerate their position and say it's perfectly fine. They're really asking us to endorse it and say it's fine. And it's impossible to do that and be a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus. You know, Jesus doesn't endorse Pornea and his followers cannot because we call him Lord. We call him our teacher. Um, And therefore he paid a price for speaking the truth and we're going to pay a price for speaking the truth. But the big clash is coming because the world has decided to champion this lifestyle and there is no other real as far as I know, um, contrary lifestyle, which is being championed. So adultery is not being championed. It may be promoted, but it's not being, uh, it's not as though the world is saying, we want you to tick all the boxes and love it. Yeah, there's no pride marches for adultery and there's no rainbow or equivalent of your email signature at work for adultery. Or Or greed or drunkenness. Yeah, yeah, so these things are still uh, done, but the philosophy is being pushed and that's where the clash is coming. Two philosophies are clashing. What are some of your pieces of advice uh, that you would give to people who are trying to share the gospel in a world where people seem to be more hostile to Christian thinking uh, and we'll call you names for having a Christian view? What are some of your pieces of advice for that? Well, we recently had a little series in the morning in our services, and um, I thought it was quite useful. We turned it into a mnemonic um, uh, action, the word action. And actually, I was um, seriously, I was praying this morning that our people would not forget the mnemonic. So I'm glad you've... um, Raised it. You're going to pop it on me and say, Jared, what's action stand for? And, uh, so it stands for A, ask God to give you a good opportunity. Yeah. And you never know how this will happen. Um, just to tell you a quick story of, I've mentioned before, I was once eating a pizza on the train near, near the train station in Artaman. And there was a girl sitting on the other end of the bench. And... Um, I said to her, I'm not going to finish this. Would you like a piece of pizza? And she said, yes. And I said, what do you do? And she said, I work in Chatswood. She said, what do you do? I said, I'm a pastor. She said, as in a P-A-S-T-O-R. And she said, tell me about Christianity. I don't really know anything about it. Wow. Now, it starts with pizza. I had prayed that morning for an opportunity, which I don't do as often as I should. But the Lord knows how to open doors, yeah. nice doors, mm. not terrible doors. The C is to carry something. A, to ask. C, to carry something. You know, a little booklet, a little card, something you can give to people. T is, what was the T? Can you remember? remember. It was to talk naturally about God when he comes. Just speak about him in natural conversation. Somebody says, what a beautiful day. You say, isn't God good? That's all. Yeah. I do remember the I. The eye. Because it was the most forced one out of all of them. It was the most forced one, yeah. <laughs> Introduce the do-done. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Introduce something which is going to clarify the issues for them. Yeah. And I've often said that the little do-done distinction is a very helpful one because you're sitting at a cafe, you've got a paper serviette there. You say to the person, has anyone ever explained to you how religion and Christianity differ? This is religion. You write D-O mm. on the serviette. You see, religion is what you do. You do, you do, you do, you do, you do, you do, and you never know whether you've been doing enough, so it's pretty miserable. This is Christianity, and you write down D-O-N-E, because Jesus of the cross has done it. He's died for you. He's paid. He's paid your debt. Now you've got a gift being held to you. So that's a good, simple distinction. Then the O is... um, 
The O is offer to pray for people. That's right. Yeah. That was a good one. Yeah. To say to somebody when they tell you that they've got a really tough time with their old mum or their young daughter or their difficult son, I'll pray for you. Mm. That's all. Yeah. And the N is what's your next step going to be? In mm -hmm. other words, how will you take things further? You've said to the guy in the chemist, you're going to pray for him because of his dear mum. Next time you go past the chemist, you drop in and say, how is she? I've been praying. Yeah. Or here's a little um, New Testament, just with a couple of promises I've marked for you to read. Yeah. So I think those are things that almost anybody can do. And just a reminder to everyone that there are a bunch of resources, including those at the bottom left-hand side of the church bookstore, which you can yeah. pick up for free. To yeah. With you. Yeah. yeah. So action, ask, carry, talk naturally, introduce the do done, if possible, offer to pray, What's the next step? That's great. Mm. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. I just want to ask if you have any last thoughts about that would help people in their witness. I think one of the great things in the Christian life, as the old song used to say, is um, to trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. And I think a huge amount of our witness has got to do with being happy in Jesus. Mm. So when I am miserable because of sin or stupidity or doubt or something like that, you know, my mouth closes and I don't really feel like saying anything to anybody. But if I trust and obey, remember the gospel, thank the Lord for his goodness, then I can bump into somebody and I can say something that's kind and cheerful mm. and I'm reminding myself that Jesus is wonderful. You know, I'm not trying to get somebody who's running along the road and put them in a cage called Christianity. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find somebody who's in a cage called sin and get them out. Yeah. You know, I'm not the dog catcher wanting to put somebody who's happy into unhappy. Yeah. I'm wanting to put somebody who's completely in the dark into the light. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to do. And so... The, I think the important thing is just concentrate on where you stand and be grateful and joyful and then ask the Lord to help you to be useful. That's great. Thanks so much, Simon. Really appreciate your Thanks time. Thanks for asking.